Used to get my head done, used to have my nails long, used to wear and make up every day. Used to rush to work and have no time for fun and spend half of my life on full highways. Then the world closed down, stuck inside this town, home with the family, all new reality. Four walls and a door, nothing's like before you and me and no distractions. So let's just keep it simple. There's so much we can do at home Build a fort in the living room Have a pillow fight, grill cheese in our bed And we'll look at stars and eyes, keep it simple Disconnect the Good morning! Happy Wednesday! This day was actually supposed to be very different than what it's turned out to be. I was supposed to have a client at 7 a.m. and then see my couple clients. I train like a couple at 8.30. My 7 a.m. recanceled. My 8.30, they're very COVID safe. Um, so we train outside and it is currently raining. So instead I had the whole morning free and I was like, I'm gonna go to a workout class. So I went to class this morning and now I have a big break. I'm gonna film another video, but I have my bar class at 12.30 and then I have a client coming here at six. But in the meantime, we're gonna talk about calorie deficits because I made this video and many others where I've talked about caloric deficits before. And the big question I get is, I don't like counting calories, so how do I otherwise get myself into a caloric deficit? And there are some different tactics that you can use. So today I'm gonna break down three different tactics that do not require counting calories. Remember that calorie counting, while it is going to be a lot more accurate than some of these other methods, it's not really necessary for people. And also calorie counting is not accurate. It's all a guesstimate and if it doesn't work for you, there are tons of other options and tactics that you can choose from. So I'm gonna break down three today. Let's jump into the first one. So the first thing that I recommend is changing up your plate ratio. I've talked a lot in other videos about a balanced plate, and I consider that to be one to two servings of proteins, fats, carbs, and veggies or micronutrients, we'll call them. Or we can kind of think of that as like fiber, right? Fruits and vegetables. And actually just starting with that is a great place to start because I find that with most of my nutrition clients I've worked with, they don't do that. What do people like to prioritize? Fats and carbs, right? I mean, they're the tastiest. I don't blame anybody. So even if you can just start with trying to get an equal serving size of each of those at your meals, that's gonna be a great start. And remembering with your serving sizes, you don't actually need to use like measuring cups, right? You can just use your hand. So your palm is going to be a serving of protein. Your thumb is gonna be a serving of fats. Your cupped hand is gonna be a serving of carbohydrates. And then what am I missing? Oh, your veggies, that's gonna be a fist. But let's say you're already really consistent with building a balanced plate but you're not in a caloric deficit. So this is where restructuring the ratio of your plate comes into play. So instead of prioritizing making everything equal on your plate, I would recommend shifting the ratio of your plate to prioritize more of the protein and the veggies or your fiber source rather than the carbs and the fat source. I am not saying eliminate those things. They have a purpose, they are important, they are also delicious, which is also a big importance in food in my opinion. You need to enjoy it. But I'm simply saying to bump up or prioritize the other two categories. And the reason for this is because fats and carbohydrates are just simply more calorically dense than your protein and veggies. So if you are bumping up the ratio of the things that are not as calorically dense, you are more than likely going to be putting yourself into that caloric deficit. And just an added bonus of increasing that protein and your veggies or your fiber, whatever we want to call it, those are going to be more satisfying as far as keeping you fuller longer. I don't know why that was such a hard sentence to say. <laughs> protein and fiber simply just take a longer time to digest and get broken down in the body so that energy is just going to last you longer. So that's the first tactic that I recommend. We're going to get to the second one a little bit later this afternoon because I do have to keep on moving with the day. So it's about 9 30. We're going to start to get some admin work done and then when Kevin starts his work in his office I'm going to take over the living room to film another YouTube video and then we're going to teach bar class and then I'll meet you back. I'll meet you back somewhere in the apartment around one o'clock. Bye! teaching bar in like 30 minutes, but I just want to finish up I'm planning Kevin a surprise birthday party. I think by the time this comes out, the party will have already happened. Otherwise, I need to 
<laughs> need to reschedule this video. But essentially I'm planning a surprise party in Philly. I rented out a space at a bar and it's a Kevin themed birthday. So you have to come dressed up as your favorite famous Kevin or Kevin throughout history. I am going as Kevin Malone from the office. And toward the end of the night, we're all gonna have like a fashion show where Kevin gets to Oh, that's something else I need to buy. I need to buy one of those like microphones that, you know, the ones that like kids use. Basically, he's gonna pick a winner of who had the best costume through the night and I'm gonna put together like a little gift basket or something for that person to win. But I'm booking our hotel right now and I'm using points for my credit card. And I feel like I've been recommending this card to a lot of my friends recently because I quite literally have not paid for a hotel room in four or five years. So it's the, it's the Marriott Bonvoy. I've had this card for years and it's basically my go-to credit card for like random expenses through the month. So I buy groceries with it. If I go to the bodega, I use it. Going out to restaurants, I think you get like double points or something. So basically I just make sure at the end of the month that I know what I've put onto it. But all of this rack up points. And so right now I have, I have 121,000 points. So there's a lot of hotel rooms that I can do. So I'm gonna leave it linked below. This is so not sponsored. That'd be amazing though. If anyone works for whatever company could get me sponsored for that, I'm your girl. No, but I just feel like talking with so many of my friends, especially as like the world is reopening and all of these like weddings are finally happening that have gotten postponed. It's so nice to have these points saved up because it's gonna save you like a couple hundred dollars. I have found that it's well worth it. This is one of the only credit cards I've stuck with long-term because I do find that it's worth it. But anyway, we're gonna finish uh, booking the hotel and then I have a few other things to tie loose ends on. Yeah, I have to get travel. I'm gonna put that on this card too, get them points. I have to buy the, his gift, I have to get the mic. I have to start planning out what's gonna be in that gift basket. And I have to finish up getting the last pieces of my phenomenal costume. Okay, great. Let's teach a bar class, everybody. Ooh, wait, let me show you this playlist. It's like a 90s remix playlist. I'm very excited about this one. I always have my Spotify linked below. I have hundreds of playlists for my classes, so check it out. And then I promise after class, we're gonna talk more about chlor deficits. <laughs> Hello. Zero clips from class because I actually wasn't filming that one, but it was fun, it was sweaty, and we had like 10 or 11 people in it, which is, I mean, you know what? For a Wednesday afternoon, two plus years in this pandemic, I am absolutely thrilled to have 12 people, how many, 11? 11 people show up for class in the middle of the day. All right, as promised, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what this video is about. The second tactic that I recommend to people who don't enjoy calorie counting or can't for whatever reason, but they do wanna be in a caloric deficit, is to increase your NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis. <laughs> I have talked about this endlessly, but let's quickly break it down one more time. Your NEAT is any type of movement that you do during the day that is not considered formal exercise. So that bar class that I just taught, not considered my NEAT. The walk that we're gonna go on in a little bit, that is part of my NEAT. So it's your step count, it's doing the dishes, it's playing with your kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see in this chart over here, your NEAT actually makes up a huge part of your total daily energy expenditure, especially compared to your exercise. So this is one of the many reasons I do not focus on exercise being one of your main tactics for putting yourself in a caloric deficit, because you're simply not burning as many calories as you think. And there's lots of other reasons why I find it very problematic. Oh God, I'm sweating. Getting heated. Huh, okay. Ooh, got that. Look at that. Post-class pump. Okay, so basically focusing on your knee can actually kind of tip the scales into you being in a caloric deficit. Most people like to measure this by taking their step count. I use a Fitbit, you can use anything that you want. Remember that these aren't 100% accurate, but it is gonna give you a pretty good gauge of where you're at. Like it's not gonna be like 5,000 steps off, you know? So what I recommend for a clean starting point is to measure your step count for the entire week. Take your weekly average, and then for your next week's goal, add a thousand steps to it. See if you can hit that consistently for a few weeks, then maybe you add a thousand more or 500 more and just slowly get yourself up to minimum 7,000 steps a day. I know that we are talking about this from a caloric deficit point of view, but I also just wanna really quickly touch on the health benefits of taking 7,000 steps a day. All of the studies show that once you hit that 7,000 mark per day on average, your risk of developing some kind of chronic illness drastically goes down. I'm talking like plummets exponentially. Can you do exponentially down or is that just up? So this way. Diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. The risk of all of these things go way down at 7,000 steps per day. They go down a little bit more if you're up in like the 10,000 range. But again, the science shows 
seven thousand steps a day i'm gonna i'm gonna make a whole video about this where i really just drill this home to people and why it's so important but you get you get the teaser right now you know if you don't like counting your steps like if you're just not a numbers person or for whatever reason it doesn't work for you make note of the little actions instead can you add in a daily walk can you take the stairs in your apartment building can you park at the back of the parking lot like all of those little things do add up there are endless options you simply need to figure out where you can actually carve out time in your day to get them done so so we have one more tactic to talk about but first we got to start some editing so i'm gonna do i'm gonna edit for a bit i'm supposed to film one more thing today but i don't really feel like it i also want to get in a walk because we have to get garbage bags hand soap and paper towels i have a client coming here at six which means that i have to clean up this space and i want to mop to make it not disgusting for her to put her body on the floor and then that's it but let's let's get like a nice rough cut of this video at least i'd love to finish it today but it's gonna be like 30 minutes long Okay, let's go. Oh. All right, how's this angle? We are almost to the end of our day. Kevin actually just told me that the final episode of Moon Knight is out, so I can't wait. Any Marvel fans? We're seeing Doctor Strange on Friday. Please let me know. No spoilers, no spoilies, but down in the comments, let me know what you think. Final recommendation here. I'm gonna recommend that you reduce your snacking. And I know that this is kind of controversial because this sounds like I'm preaching restriction. So on a personal level, I'm actually not a big snacker. I find that I just feel better during the day when I get most of my food from my meals. But that is purely anecdotal and has nothing to do with my recommendation. I only say it to point out that anecdotal evidence like that isn't necessarily a reason to try something. Now, the reason I'm recommending it is from my work with client experience. I have found that so often when I ask clients to either keep a food diary or maybe they prefer calorie counting, their highest caloric intake comes from their snacks. Whether it's randomly throughout the day, whether it's one big snack at the end of the day, and this happens for a few different reasons. Maybe you're not eating enough at your meals so then you end of overeating in your snacks. Maybe you're restricting throughout the entire day and by the end of the day you're starving and you go into kind of this restrict binge mindset. Maybe you're reaching for things out of habit. Maybe you're reaching for snacks because you're stressed. Maybe it's because you're bored. No matter the reason, I often see a caloric surplus coming from people snacking. So here's what I actually recommend. Ensure that you are hitting your plate ratio, prioritizing your veggies and your proteins at your meals, and just take a second and think before you reach for a snack. Am I physically hungry? Am I bored? Am I stressed? Is this a habit? Do I always go for this exact thing at this time of day? Do I really want this? How will this make me feel? And you know what? Sometimes you'll go through those questions and the answer is still, yeah, I want this right now. But I find that so often with clients, just by taking a second and bringing awareness into your situation, into your choices, a lot of times people realize they don't actually need or want the snack. So remember that you can have the snack. I'm not saying to eliminate snacking altogether. Restriction does not work long term. But the most important thing here is that you are actually in tune with the decision that you're making and you understand why you're making it. So to reiterate for like the 15th time, there is absolutely nothing wrong with snacking. I just want you to understand why you're doing it. So if you have any questions at all about anything that we talked about today, let me know down in the comments below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out and I will see you all in the next one.